share with you guys today, um, just kind of in light of what is going on in Israel. We talked about that before prayer. And, uh, I don't know that everybody, I'm glad there's some young people here. I know a lot of you guys uh, probably know a good bit about Israel. Has anybody ever been to Israel in here? I kind of wondered if maybe anybody had made that trip at some point in life. You certainly probably wouldn't make it now, I would imagine. But uh, um, Israel, pretty much as long as man has existed, has been the center of humanity. Um, that's what the Bible tells us. And I think it's good. It's not good what's going on. But perhaps it's a good thing that our attention is kind of being drawn to that place right now. Because as a church, as a body of believers, uh, as part of the global church, our eyes should always be on Israel and revolve around what's going on there because a lot of our past, our present, and what God's going to do in the future revolves around this area. And yes, there's wars going on now there, and a lot of that seems like people are are in a tug of war for land and a place to live and to go about their daily lives. Um, but there's there's a deeper uh, surface to that. And uh, for, for, for forever, God has had this walk with the people of Israel. They're, they're his chosen people. Um, how exactly does that work? Well, maybe we can touch on that a little bit. Um, this image that I have up on the screen is actually looking uh, at a site in Israel um, that I would say is the hub, is, the, is, is probably the central focus and the reason that so much is happening in Israel and has happened in Israel throughout um, all of history. I don't want to make this a social studies uh, class and, and boring and drag you guys through that, but I, I, I hope we can glean from this and, and learn some things about Israel uh, and just have an understanding of what God is doing and what God has done and what God will do. So this place, like I said, is, is a central focus. And I would say that all of the wars, just despite what we may think if we're fighting over the Gaza Strip and things like that, um, it all kind of boils down to Jerusalem. And inside of Jerusalem, this particular site that we're overlooking right here, uh, just something kind of neat to uh, mention is where you're standing right now, looking over Israel, is the Mount of Olives. Jesus ascended into heaven from, from this site where we're standing right now. So if you turned around and looked up in Imagine you turned around and looked up into the heavens. This is where Jesus would have ascended into heaven. Um, but why are we talking about that particular site there? I don't know if you guys can read that, but I'll read it to you, and I'll try to move through it quickly. Um, in Genesis 22, 1 through 18. Now it came about after these things that God tested Abraham and said to him, Abraham, and he said, Here I am. He said, take, your na take now your only son, whom you love, Isaac, and go to the land of Moriah and offer him there as a burnt offering on one of the mountains which I will tell you. So Abraham rose early in the morning and saddled his donkey and took two of his young men with him and Isaac his son. And he split wood for the burnt offering and arose and went to the place of which God had told him. On the third day, Abraham raised his eyes and saw the place from a distance. Abraham said to his young men, Stay here with the donkey, and I and the lad will go over there, and we will worship and return to you. And Abraham took the wood of the burnt offering and laid it on Isaac his son. And he took in his hand the fire and the knife. So the two of them walked on together. And Isaac spoke to Abraham his father and said, My father, he said, Here I am, my son. And he said, Behold the fire and the wood, but where is the lamb for the burnt offering? And Abraham said, 
God will provide for himself the lamb, for the burnt offering, my son. So the two of them walked on together. Then they came to a place of which God had told him. And Abraham built the altar there and arranged the wood, and bound his son Isaac and laid him on the altar on top of the wood. And Abraham stretched out his hand and took the knife to slay his son. But the angel of the Lord called him from heaven and said, Abraham, Abraham. And he said, Here I am. And he said, Do not stretch out your hand against the lad, and do nothing to him. For now I know that you fear God, since you have not withheld your son, your only son, from me. Then Abraham raised his eyes and looked, and behold, behind him a ram caught in a thicket by his horns. And Abraham went and took the ram and offered him up for a burnt offering in the place of his son. Abraham called the name of that place, the Lord will provide. As it is said to this day, in the mount the Lord of the Lord it will be provided. So this, this scripture right here that I read to you, something I want to point out is um, that site that we looked at is a, is a major central hub for, for several religions of the major religions in this world. It's a, it's a very important site for Islam. And it's a very important site for Christians and for the Jewish people. Um, and what's interesting is in this, this section that I just read to you of the Bible, where Islam separates itself or differentiates itself and says that actually our Bible is in error, is that they hold that Abraham was told to sacrifice Ishmael. They draw their lineage and trace it back and believe that they come from Ishmael. And so they say the Bible is in error to say that Isaac, um, first of all, Islam, they believe that holy people can commit no sin. So therefore, Abraham could not have sinned. Um, so they say that he would not um, have had Ishmael without um, Hagar, his mother, being his wife. Um, I won't go into all of that, but anyway... Uh, Hagar causes some problems in Abraham's family um, with his wife, Sarah. And God informs Abraham to send Ishmael away. So he does. He leaves Ishmael in the desert. But God told Abraham, because he was distraught about this, and he did love Ishmael, that God would provide for him, that he would make a great nation out of him. So Abraham had the comfort of knowing that Ishmael would be fine. But in our scripture that we're reading, it actually identifies Isaac as Abraham's only son. And I'll say, I told you about Ishmael to say that the reason it says that is because Ishmael has already been left behind. He's no longer a part of Abraham's life. So he is Abraham's only son in the sense that he is the only son that he has with him in his, in his possession. Um, to be a part of his life. So Islam holds that because Ishmael was left in the desert, that was actually Abraham's sacrifice. Not the story we have where Isaac is going to be um, sacrificed on an altar. But if we believe the Holy Scriptures and we believe the Bible, then, then we have to believe this story. And something significant that I want to point out about it is this. Um, in Genesis 22, I got 1 through 18 there, that's not correct, 15 through 18. He says, Then the angel of the Lord called to Abraham a second time from heaven and said, By myself I have sworn, declares the Lord, because you have done this thing and have not withheld your son, your only son. Indeed, I will greatly bless you, and I will greatly multiply your seed as the stars of the heavens and the sand which is on the seashore, and your seed shall possess the gate of their enemies. In your seed, all nations of the earth shall be blessed, because you have obeyed my voice. So I want us to just take a moment to focus on what it's saying right here. That God is going to honor and bless Abraham. <coughs> that he's going to Increase him, that he's going to uh, take care of his seed, that they're going to be great nations. Um, and why? Because Abraham obeyed God. Because he was willing, 
in that moment, without really knowing why, to yield up his will and bow to God and, and do what God asked him to do. And I would say that this right here is, is the, the covenant. It, it is where God actually saw worth in Abraham over everyone else who was alive during this time. And it's why that God put up with the Israelites, the descendants of Abraham, through <laughs> centuries and millennia of, of push and pull and fight and, and war and, and disbelief and dishonor and so many things that Israel struggled through with God because Abraham did this right here, God saw worth and he found a reason to go through all of it. So in 2000 BC, we have Abraham's altar where he was um, to take Isaac and sacrifice him. Um, I won't read that because we just read through it, but he was instructed to go to Mount Moriah, if you notice. Um, that's, that's where Abraham went to and built the altar, the, the altar for Isaac on top of Mount Moriah. Roughly a thousand years later, we have David's altar. In 2 Samuel 24, 18 through 21, it says, So Gad came to David that day and said to him, Go up, erect an altar to the Lord on the threshing floor of Arana, the Jebusite. And David went up according to the word of Gad. Just as the Lord had commanded, Arona looked down and saw the king and his servants crossing over toward him. And Arona went out and bowed his face and to the ground. And before the king, then Arona said, Why has my lord the king come to his servant? And David said, to buy the threshing floor from you in order to build an altar to the Lord that the plague may be held back from the people. The plague that David is talking about here, um, David decided to take a census of Israel, mainly to, to gather the strength of his army, to know how strong and how many men he had in his army. And what happened is David took the census and he didn't do it in the way that Moses um, actually was instructed by the Lord originally. He said any time that Israel took a census, that each person that was counted in the census had to give half a shekel uh, as a penance for their life. Uh, half a shekel was, was nominal for most people, and that's why God said it there. He said whether you're a poor person or a rich person, give half a shekel every time you're counted in the census. Uh, a census. So David did this and he did not require that. And so what happened is God began a plague on the Israelites. 70,000 people were, were destroyed by an angel of the Lord because of this. And, and David asked God to please stop and to hold him accountable for what had happened. And at the place David was at at the time, it just so happens that he saw the angel of the Lord on top of this this hill, and this was the threshing floor of Arana. And so he goes up and he builds, and he's instructed by God to build an altar there. Solomon's temple, a few years later, um, this is the establishment of the Temple Mount, uh, the central point that we were looking at in that picture earlier, the central point of Jerusalem. And we'll learn more about that as we go. But it says, Then Solomon began to build the house of the Lord in Jerusalem on Mount Moriah. Okay, so Mount Moriah, that was where Abraham was instructed to sacrifice Isaac, and he built an altar there. Where the Lord had appeared to his father David, at the place that David had prepared on the threshing floor of Aroma, the Jebusite. So here we have three pieces, very important pieces of Israelite history happening. So before, before this moment when Solomon's temple was built, um, God was with the Israelites moving around in a tent called the Tabernacle. And this place followed Israel wherever they went. 
And God actually began to kind of become frustrated with that. He told David, I I have no I have no place. You have a, you all have houses of wood, stone, and I have nothing. Build for me a place. So David is going to do this, but God tells David, You you can't because you're a man of war. So your son Solomon will build my temple. And so here in 967 BC, Solomon builds this temple on Mount Moriah, which is also this threshing floor where David was commanded to go to and build his altar in order to make sacrifice to stop the, the plague that was going on where the angel of the Lord was destroying the Israelites. So these three significant events all happen in the same place. What we know today is the Temple Mount. It's still there today. We can't go walk up on top of it, but we can go look at it. It's the most holy place on earth. It's the central point of the story of the Bible. It's where God dwelled with man. There was a place there called the Holy of Holies, which was the most sacred place. There was a curtain there that separated God, and only a high priest could go in there once a year, and he had to go through several cleansing uh, rituals and ceremonies to even be able to enter into that, to that location. Um, there's a lot more history about the Temple Mount. A lot of things uh, that we could go through. And uh, I just want to touch on them briefly because the, the Temple Mount is literally, it's riddled with history and Israel's struggle and all of these other people and, and all of this, bear in mind that all of this mostly happens because Israel cannot keep their covenant with God. They won't, they won't do what God has asked them to do. It's as simple as, as honoring God and believing in God and, and keeping his, his law as much as possible. But despite what these people have seen throughout all their history, they keep turning away from God. God time and time again has proved himself to Israel that he's faithful to them. And again, I would say that's because of his promise that he made to Abraham, because of what Abraham did. So first in 720 B.C., Ahaz, who is the king of Judah, so Israel split into two tribes. We have Judah and we have Israel. Ahaz begins to uh, dabble in, in another uh, country's rituals and, and in their beliefs. And so he actually desecrates the temple, tears down part of it, builds another temple where he actually carries out the, the services that God has required at the temple, but he's doing it somewhere else. And he begins eventually to start doing it to other gods instead of our God, the God of Israel. Uh, later, um, we have King Josiah. King Josiah realizes the shape that the temple's in. King Josiah repairs that temple. Then, again, Israel begins to turn away. Um, and God sends uh, the Babylonians in. And the Babylonians completely carry away the Jewish people to Babylon. And not only that, but they also destroyed this temple. Solomon's temple is destroyed by the Babylons. Um, throughout their captivity in Babylon, uh, God begins to reveal to several prophets that there will be a temple rebuilt. And he works that out through history um, to where eventually Zerubbabel is able to rebuild a second temple. So now we have a second temple built in the same place. So it's, it's, it's rebuilt exactly where the old one was. Um, then we later in 175 BC, uh, the Greeks begin to become a power. And Antiochus uh, comes and he builds an altar to Zeus in this temple mount. Then in 163, we have the Maccabean Revolt. This is where the Jews revolt against the Greeks, and they take back the Temple Mount. And then they restore Jewish uh, rituals and the sacrifice and the ceremonies that God has instructed them to do. 
Then in 63, Pompey enters the Holy of Holies. So Pompey is a, a Roman, and this is just in one event. He ransacks Jerusalem, and he actually goes into the temple and goes into the Holy of Holies where no one in Jewish history, no other Israelite other than the high priest has ever been allowed to even go. Um, but he doesn't actually do anything to the temple. He, he leaves and he allows the Jews to continue as they were practicing. So they, they do what they think is purifying the temple and they move on. So then in 100 BC, Herod um, is a, he's a, a Jewish Roman uh, king. He's, he is uh, allowed to rule in the area of Jerusalem and over Israel despite or under Roman authority. So the Romans are still in charge, but Herod's temple, he actually just expands that second temple that Zerubbabel built. So Herod expands it, makes it bigger, fancier. Um, and as we read through the New Testament and we read Jesus talking about this, this temple many times and we hear about Jesus going to the temple and about all of the worship and the practices that are happening in the temple, this is the temple that Jesus is going to. It's, it's, it's Herod's temple, which is still the temple now that we're, we're beginning to gather is the place, the central point through all of history. So one thing I want to point out about Jesus and this temple. Um, so in 70 AD, Herod's temple was destroyed by the Romans, um, by Vespian and Titus. And Jesus actually predicts this in Matthew 24, 2. He says to them, do you not see all these things? Truly I say to you, not one stone here will be left upon another which will not be torn down. And what I want to point out as uh, significant about the destruction of the temple in 70 AD, um, first is that Jesus did predict it. Jesus said that it was going to happen and it did. Um, so Jesus is living, uh, he's, he, he, of course, eight, uh, AD actually begins after Christ's death in 30, roughly 30, 33 AD. So in 70 AD, the Roman temple is destroyed. So in Matthew, we have this, this scripture where Jesus predicts that this is going to happen. Another thing I'd like to point out about our, our scriptures, our New Testament, is that they're very reliable because of this event. What this event tells us is that all four of our Gospels, and likely the majority of the New Testament was actually written before this event, before 70 AD. Uh, the main reason that scholars say that we know this is because it's not actually mentioned in our New Testament. And they're saying an event this significant where the, the Holy Temple, uh, where God dwelled with the Israelites, was torn down by the Romans. And if it's not mentioned in there, it probably means that our scriptures predate that event. So we know very early in Christian history that our Bible is very close to the time that Jesus lived. That gives us great accuracy, and it, and, and it, it touts the Bible well that the events that we read about in our New Testament um, were recorded during this time. One of the main things that I really want to, to bring a point to here is that Jewish sacrifice, so the slaughtering of animals in penance for, for sin, stopped in 70 AD. Because God's rules that he gave to the Israelites at the beginning of his uh, struggle with them, his, his life with them, um, was that they would make sacrifice for their sins. They would sacrifice animals on the altar before the temple. And so this ceased in 70 AD. So from 70 AD to now, there has been no temple sacrifice. There has been what God calls the Israelites to do in order to 
justify themselves, to have to be forgiven for their sins, they're not able to do anymore. Because they can't do it in the way that God has instructed them to do it. This is a model of what they think Herod's temple uh, would have looked like um, during the days of Jesus and during our New Testament times before 70 AD. So this is this is a model of what, you know, based on its description, what it would have looked like prior to it being torn down by the Romans. Uh, after the temple's actually destroyed, the temple mount is still there, so the big flat area that we saw there um, is is still present. Um, the temple's tore down. A lot of the walls around the sides are gone, so we've just got a big flat area. Uh, I'll show you another picture in a minute where you can kind of see that. But um, there's still a lot of history that happened um, after the temple was actually destroyed. So in 130 AD, we have another Roman um, who comes and he erects a shrine. Uh, so he has a statue of himself and a statue of their god Jupiter that he builds in this spot on the Temple Mount, the holy place that the Lord had established with the Israels. That's later torn down, and in 324 to 638, we have what's called the Byzantine period. The Byzantine period is a period um, where Constantine, he was the Eastern Roman uh, Caesar. So he was an emperor of Rome from the Eastern part of Rome. He actually adopts Christianity as the Roman um, faith. And so all of the Middle East at that point in time was pretty much controlled by Rome, and so Christianity was actually the predominant religion in the, in the Middle East during this time. Um, well, it was the most forceful. It was, it was what, we still had Jews and we still had everything else, but um, they, were, they were in control of the area. And what actually happened during the Byzantine time is that uh, they just didn't do anything. And the reason they didn't do anything to the Temple Mount was because of what Jesus said in Matthew 24 too. He said, not one stone will be left upon another. So the Christians didn't see any point in trying to rebuild the temple. First of all, they, they believed that Jesus was, was the sacrifice that he said he was, and there's no point in rebuilding this temple to them. But then, in 361 AD, we have a man named Olympus. And Olympus is from Western Rome. And he doesn't believe in Christianity. He actually is more for the old Greek gods and the Hellenistic gods of, of prior Roman times. And so actually what he does is, in spite of uh, Constantine and the Christians, he, he actually sends some, or I'm sorry, this is Julian. Julian sends Olympus to build the temple in Israel. Uh, and he's building it again for the Jewish people, but it's all in spite of Christianity actually becoming the, the largest religion at that point in time and the religion that Rome had imposed on the territory. Uh, but that temple is never fully constructed, and um, it's actually torn down. Then in 610 to 615, we have the Sassanid in the Jewish attempt to rebuild the Jewish temple. Um, the Sassanids were actually the Arabs of the day. So Islam is actually created around the same time. The date that Islam is given for being founded by Muhammad is 610 AD. So 600 years after Christ, we have the Islamic faith being founded. So this is not the Islamic Arabs, but this is the Arabs prior to them um, who actually had a different religion, but they actually teamed up with the Jewish, the Jewish people in order to push out the Byzantine Empire, and they were successful in doing that, and their agreement was that the Jews could actually rebuild the temple. Uh, now there's not much 
of an, an excuse or a reason to, that the, the Jews would not have uh, started to rebuild the temple here because they kind of had the opportunity. They were, they were given control by the Sassanid Empire, the Arabs, that were not, again, the uh, people of Islam. So then the Byzantine people come back, the Christians come back and they push out this Sassanid Jewish uh, empire and they actually destroy uh, what they had started as an attempt number two for the Jewish temple. And believe it or not, the Temple Mount, Christians, Byzantine Empire, leaves the most holy place on earth, desolate, and it becomes a trash dump. So it's a place where trash was collected in Jerusalem and thrown on top of the Temple Mount. You guys good? <laughs> I'm moving through a lot of stuff here, aren't I? <laughs> uh, so, 692 AD. So, 82 years after its founding, because Islam was founded in uh, 16 AD. So, in 692 AD, uh, the Islamic faith, the, those Arabs push. Byzantine Empire out again. So 692 AD, this is this is the this is the people who are currently in war with Israel for Israel. So that's a long time, isn't it? From less than a thousand years away from Jesus' death now to be fighting over that territory but what happens is 82 years after their founding um, they come into to Israel again and they push the Byzantine Empire out of Jerusalem and they build a temple and so Omar was o Caliph Omar was the ruler and after they they ran the Jews out they um Omar demanded that uh, they give him a place to build a sanctuary. And I'm kind of wondering here why this happened, because he didn't know anything about the Temple Mount, but he's told, um, well, the place to build your sanctuary is the Temple Mount, this trash pile that the Byzantines had left. And so they go and they clear out the trash pile and they find a rock sticking up. So the big flat concrete stone looking area we saw, there's actually a peak of a mountain sticking up there. And so uh, Islam actually builds what's called the Dome of the Rock there. So what we actually learn, or um, history holds it, that that Dome of that Rock is actually where the Holy of Holies was. I mean, you can't Sometimes the irony in the Bible is what actually gives me the most faith. Um, so the Holy of Holies, God's strongest presence in our world, where he was at inside the temple, where he was separated from humans, but his strongest presence was on top of the dome of that rock. That's where the Holy of Holies was constructed, and now Islam has built a temple around that peak called the Dome of the Rock. The only people allowed to go on top of the Temple Mount now are uh, the people of Islam, people with that faith. What's interesting about that is, is Israel is actually in control of this area. Israel owns the area or holds its strength in the area where the Temple Mount is. But Israel... Um, is nearly 50% secular, so they don't actually hold the traditional Jewish faith. Um, and their government is actually considered to be secular, so they're, they're kind of like America claims to be. They're accepting of all religions. They're tolerant of all religions. 
So in order not to engage in war or to tick off the people of Islam, they allow them to have control of this temple now. And Jews that live in Israel and have control of Israel are not allowed to go on top of that temple now and go into that, that mosque. Um, I don't know about you guys, I find that kind of interesting. So, uh, I want to take a look back for just a moment at Genesis 22. Um, it said, again, what God promised to Abraham. He said, then the angel of the Lord called to Abraham a second time from heaven and said, By myself I have sworn, declares the Lord, because you have done this thing and have not withheld your son, your only son. Indeed, I will greatly bless you. And I will greatly multiply your seed as the stars of the heavens and as the sand which is on the seashore. And your seed shall possess the gate of their enemies. And in your seed all the nations of the earth shall be blessed because you have obeyed my voice. Uh, something that's significant that I want to point out here is you guys uh, read that. Read uh, that because you have done this thing and have not withheld your son, your only son. Does that sound <coughs> familiar to you guys? So at the beginning of God's walk with Israel, he requested something of Abraham that he did not require from Abraham. In fact, he flips it around, and rather than requiring it from Abraham, he gives it to him. He gives it to Abraham and his children and his descendants. He gives his, God gives his only son for the nations. God does for Abraham what he required of Abraham, but didn't. So, something significant about the temple before it was destroyed, before Herod's temp, uh, temple was destroyed, Jesus, when he began his ministry, um, he was taken to the highest place in the temple by Satan. And he was tempted there. And, and at the highest point, so then we're talking about this temple now, right? This place through all the history that we've just, we've just gone through and talked about and how significant of a place this is throughout Jewish history and world history and, and to all faiths, um, he's taken on top of the Temple Mount, the highest point, and, he, and Satan tells him, if you'll throw yourself off of here, you will prove to me that you are the Son of God. Jesus didn't do this. He actually refuted Satan. And he basically said, it's not my time. My work is not done. So if Jesus had thrown himself off of this temple and at that moment proven himself to be the son of God, then, then his work would not have been done. His sacrifice would have not happened. Men would still be separated from God. So later, after Jesus has done his work and done his ministry and has paid the price, Jesus was crucified. And at the moment that Jesus passed, the curtain in Herod's temple was ripped away. The, the area on top of that rock that we were talking about, the Holy of Holies, the place where God resided on the earth, where his strongest presence was on the earth, was torn apart. And God is able to come out of the temple and live in the lives of men. To be present with us. So, 
Jesus did this because of his father, and he did this because of a command. And what actually happened at the crucifixion site is a Roman centurion. Uh, so the people that were putting Christ to death, this event happens, and the Roman centurion says, Surely this man was the Son of God. Satan asked Jesus to prove that he was the Son of God before he did his work, before he made a way for humans to be connected to God, in the presence of God. And then, before this, the, the only way anybody could be connected to God was if they were Jewish, and, and if they engaged in sacrifice. But now we have that removed, and a Roman centurion, a Gentile, not a Jew, is able to have faith, to be connected to God. And he said, surely this was the Son of God. Uh, so, the big eyesore right there in the middle of the, the Temple Mount uh, is the Islamic mosque that we were talking about, the Dome of the Rock. Um, notice what a significant area in Jerusalem that this is. I mean, it's, it's humongous in, in relation to Jerusalem. And it's extremely important. Something that I would like for you, in, in light of Jesus proving that he was the Son of God, uh, I'd like to read for you something that is actually inscribed inside of the dome of that uh, Islamic mosque. It says, So believe in God and all the messengers, and stop talking about a trinity. Say only the truth. Jesus, over whom you dispute, he is the son of Mary. It is not fitting that God should beget or father a son. That irony I was talking about. So the place where Jesus was supposed to throw himself down and prove that he was the son of God. He didn't do it because his work was not done. Later, He's crucified. The curtains rip apart in the temple that stands here. God is revealed to all men. He proves himself in the centurion and says, Surely this is the Son of God. And now in that place we have a, a mosque um, with an inscription on the ceiling that says that God should not beget a father or a son. That's interesting to me, guys. So, is there a plan for a third Jewish temple? Um, Try to wrap this up because I know I'm, I'm taking a long time here. Um, a third Jewish temple, is that a possibility? Well, in Israel there's a group of Jews who are devout. They're called the Zionists. They believe that the Jews should control all of Israel, uh, that they should have full control, uh, and they do believe in resurrecting a third temple for the Jews to begin sacrifice again, to begin practicing what God instructed Moses to do, and uh, they have what's called a Sanhedrin. This is a group of religious leaders um, who will engage in the practices that the priests um, did. They've, they've already constructed the the vessels and the things that are going to be used during the sacrifice and during the service to God. Um, one thing really interesting is in Numbers, um, the Jews believe that there has to be something called a red heifer. Um, and in Numbers, there's an instruction by God that the priests, before they can in, enter the temple, they have to um, be cleansed by this red heifer. Well, something interesting about this is that um, there's no there's no purely red cattle in Israel, so some of the requirements and numbers with the the cow could not ever be yoked, so he could never have a harness put on him, and that he had to be purely red with no spots, um, and because this doesn't exist in Israel, 
An interesting thing is that uh, a man, his last name's Lot, he's a, he's a Pentecostal pastor, and there's actually several people engaged in this kind of work, but he's actually trying to produce genetically um, Red Angus uh, cattle, and he will send the DNA for it to be used scientifically with the cattle that are already in Israel, and they're going to try to genetically create this red heifer that the Jews believe they need to use in order to purify themselves, to, re to restart temple worship, and to begin the sacrifice again. Um, and then one final thing to talk about, about ever rebuilding the third Jewish temple is the final Antichrist. So it's a good possibility that if it ever is rebuilt, that it may be under the direct guidance or power or authority of the Antichrist. So what's going to happen is a peace treaty, a peace treaty will be given with Israel. For the first time since their creation, Israel will not have to bear arms. They will not have to defend themselves. They're finally going to be promised this, and they will disarm. Right now, Israel is armed to the teeth. I think we can see that. Um, but during this time, someone is going to come, and he's going to establish a peace treaty with the Middle East and with Israel, and Israel will not be afraid to disarm. And he's going to tell them that they can engage in their worship again that they can begin to rebuild the temple, and they will rebuild the temple. And what's going to happen is in the middle of the seven-year peace treaty, the Antichrist will turn on Israel, and he will set himself up in the temple as God, to be worshipped as God. And at this time, he'll have enough power to tell the whole world that they have to worship him as God. And if they won't, then it's him or it's dead. I don't know where I sit on where <coughs> Christians will, will be during this time. I, I lean towards the rapture and that we will, will be gone before this. But I couldn't tell you for sure. But what I can tell you is, is the Bible tells us this, that we can know this. Um, we're instructed on what's going to happen. Why should our eyes be on Israel? Something I would want to point out about a third Jewish temple is that it would be blasphemy of the Spirit. The unforgivable sin. Why do I feel like that would be blasphemy of the Spirit? Well, it's because of Matthew 24, 14. It says that the gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in the whole world as a testimony to all the nations, and then the end will come. So we know before the end times that the gospel of Jesus Christ will have reached the whole world. No one will be without excuse for not accepting what the Spirit has revealed to them. How will he reveal it to them? He'll reveal it to them through the church. We're the body of Christ. We're the hands and feet of Jesus. In John 2, 18 through 22, and this is, this is me kind of getting finished up here. Uh, the Jews then said to him, What sign do you show us is your authority for doing these things? And Jesus answered them, Destroy this temple, and in three days I will raise it up. The Jews then said, It took 46 years to build this temple, and you will raise it up in three days? But he was speaking of the temple of his, whole, of his body. So when he was raised from the dead, his disciples remembered that he said this, 
And they believed in the scriptures and the word which Jesus had spoken. So the scripture tells us here that Jesus was speaking of his body and that it would be raised in three days. And indeed that happened. Um, something that I feel is that this scripture is actually a, a parallel. Sometimes the Bible actually talks about events that are going to happen and they happen at more than one time in history or they happen in more than one way. Um, so Jesus says in three days he will rebuild the temple. In 2 Peter 3, 8, we're told that um, a day to the Lord is as a thousand years on the earth. So I, I feel like if that is a parallel for what's happening, and some of you may have heard this before, that uh, in 2030, we will enter the third day. So that's a thousand years. The first day was the first thousand years after Christ died. Right now we're in the second day. In the third day, which starts with 2030, we will enter the third day. What's significant about that? Well, I told you that the, the, the worship, actually I don't think I did tell you that, but think about if the Jews are able to rebuild the third temple. They'll begin sacrifice again. They'll begin to do things that are blasphemy to the gospel of Christ. Why is that? Because Christ was the ultimate sacrifice. Christ was the final sacrifice. If the Jews, who have somehow miraculously been uh, kept from doing this since the days of Jesus, begin to do it again, That'll be in spite and in, face, in the face of Jesus and God's wanting to elevate his only son and what he did. Um, so the temple can't be rebuilt in a way where the Jews can, can begin the sacrifice again. So what happens? Well, the church is the body of Christ. The church is identified as living stones, the cornerstone that the temple will be built upon. Um, so we join together with Christ. We are the church. We are the temple now. In the third day, God will draw together this temple, this body of people around the world who believe in him. I think about why, why would Christians so... <coughs> The Jews would tell you that are the Zionists that are trying to rebuild the temple, they would tell you that Christians are actually their largest supporters for rebuilding the temple. Why would that be? Why would why would Christians be evangelicals do that? Okay, well, the reason that they would do that is because they think they're bringing about the return of Jesus Christ. But that's not our purpose here. Our purpose is not to bring about the return of Jesus Christ. God will do that in his timing, and he will do it when he's ready. So we shouldn't be providing animals to help the Jews restart temple worship. We shouldn't be providing funds to help the Jews restart temple worship. We should be funding people who will go to the Jews and tell them about Jesus. We should be funding efforts for the gospel to be spread throughout all the world because God's goal for us, he told us when he ascended into heaven, was to make disciples of him. So I think that we should reflect on where our lives, us in this tiny little town in America, thousands of miles away from Israel, where it seems like is the hub of the world, the center of this religious battle and struggle, where do we fit into that story? What is it that we can do? Well, first of all, we can strengthen our faith. We can believe in what scriptures tell us. And it's our responsibility, wherever we are, to share this message 
so that people know what is going to happen because Scripture tells us what's going to happen and people are prepared for that. Scripture tells us that the Antichrist will convince people that he is God through signs and wonders. And we already know that he's going to do this. And it's our job to instruct the next generation and the people around us what is going to happen. If they'll listen, tell them and let them know. So church, would you reflect on, on this story and on this significant place that I think we can actually determine is not so significant when it's all said and done. Revelations 21, 22 to 27. I saw no temple in it, for the Lord God Almighty and the Lamb are its temple. And the city has no need of the sun or the moon to shine on it, for the glory of God has illuminated it, and its lamp is the Lamb. The nations will walk by its light, and the kings of earth will bring their glory into it in the daytime, for there will be no night there. Its gates will never be closed. And they will bring the glory and the honor of the nations into it, and nothing unclean. No one who practices abomination and lying shall ever come into it, but only those whose names are written in the Lamb's Book of Life. There will be no temple, no place where God is separated from men. When God's work is finished and heaven and earth are combined, and this great city is built. And everyone will feel the presence of God and be in the presence of God. That's his promise to us. There will be no need for that temple that has been the source of struggle and battle and, and, and just horrible things throughout history. We have that promise, church. God, would you help us to see what your will is for us? Would you help us to know what we're supposed to do in this story? Help us not to focus so much on our lives and our everyday things, Lord. And help us to look to what your promise is. Help us to help others to understand what's going to happen, Lord. You've told us. Help us to stand firm on that, to share your gospel, to share your message, <coughs> to serve you any way that we can, Lord. And we just pray that you would be with us, guide us, and lead us in Jesus' name.